Hello my friends and welcome back. It's Thursday. Congratulations, you survived hump day. Half of the week is over and tomorrow it's Friday, so I'm gonna have a beer after work. I don't know what you're gonna do. But today I want to start with something that goes right through you. Honestly, it's whoever you are, I think it's very difficult to watch this next video without feeling something. And I, I am feeling a lot. I want to share this with you. This video is about a, a farm boy, Ukrainian farm boy, who always sees Ukrainian choppers flying above. It comes outside to wave to them with Ukrainian flag. Good luck on the battle. Save the fatherland. Please bring my father back safe from the battles. Be, please take care of him. Slavo Ukraini. And now, for once, these choppers are flying forth and back on the battlefield and the base, and they see this boy again. Two choppers. The boy is here, waving the flag, every day. And they land, they go to greet him. His dream has become true. And they have a gift for him. And he's waving them off. Even when these choppers are going to fight for their homeland, for their independence, for the nation and cultural traditions and, and their mothers and daughters and sons, they still find this five minutes to stop and go and give this little Ukrainian farm boy a gift. Even if they might not come back from the battle, they still find this time. I see these bits of humanity, these bits of kindness in Ukrainian soldiers all the time. And this is why I know I've chosen the right side. Not in history, not in politics, but in my heart. I've chosen the right side on this war in my heart. Now, my friends, we will go to France. And in every video re recently, I say with a smile in my face, uh, Vive la France, because the French are, have stepped up. Right now, Great Britain and France are two of the countries that have long-term security guarantee agreement, actual agreement signed with Ukraine. That means if Russia is gambling on that Western countries is getting tired, then no, they have an actual agreement with Great Britain and France for long-term security guarantees and military cooperation. But that's not it. The French are doing it again. I don't know where they get the balls of steel. Is Macron suddenly getting Napoleon flashbacks? But France will propose EU-wide sanctions against Russian companies that spread disinformation. The, the, one of the greatest weaknesses in Europe, Western European leaders is that they don't know what a Russian weapon is. It is not a Kalashnikov. It is not a BMP. It, this is a hard weapon, but Russia is very good with soft weapons. They're very good with money. They're very good with um, these information campaigns. And these are one of the deadliest weapons because you, you don't feel the dagger in your heart. It's so soft, but it kills you the same. Russian disinformation, propaganda campaigns in Europe. For example, that Ukraine is uh, sending 16-year-old boys to front 
pure Russian disinformation. The draft age now is 25. That's the minimum age of draft for the Ukrainian army. But this is a successful Russian disinformation campaign that worked. It's soft power and it's very deadly. And Western European leaders don't recognize this as a weapon, so they, don't, they cannot even fight against it. Well, the French are showing us the way. Show me the way the French is doing it, because they now propose these sanctions against companies who are not involved with war, but even with disinformation, which is also a weapon of war. So, French, you, whether you're having Napoleon flashbacks or whether you're having your French Revolution flashbacks, I don't know, balls of steel, huge respect points, carry on. Also, the French foreign minister speaking about the Ukrainian attacks on oil facilities in Russia said that Kiev was acting within the framework of legitimate defense. The United States said that it did not support strike on Russian territory. So, France and the United States. The United States being the most powerful military in the world and the French being always joked about how weak they are militarily. French say that you can go offensive. Go, give them hell. Yeah, Napoleon is back. And the United States, which is usually extremely aggressive, in these cases now says that no, you cannot attack Russian oil refineries in Russian territory. I gotta say, the US, I stand with the French here. This is, this is Europe. It's my Europe. I will stand with whoever defends it, whoever defends my family and my values in this continent. And right now, it's not the United States. So, to the United States citizens, I must say thank you for your contribution to this war. You have given so much. But now, we, we will take it from here. We have to, and we can. And you know, this French United States drama is not over. And <laughs> I wouldn't have, I would have ever believed that I could look up to a French decision in any kind of war and say, yes, I stand behind it. But this, this is the case. I, I'm eating my words. I'm backtracking on my own words here. Because Macron, 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 I don't know how to say it, sorry told the United States and NATO that their involvement would not be needed if French troops in Ukraine were attacked. So Macron is like, oh, we're going to send our troops in, the, in Ukraine. Remember Napoleon? Putin, do you remember Napoleon? We can do that again if you want to. Like the capturing Moscow part, not like the retreating from Moscow. And then uh, Russia says, okay, we're going to attack your troops if they're in Ukraine. And then the United States says, oh, France, you cannot send your troops because... We're not coming to aid you when they attack you. And Macron is like, ah, merda. Oh, if they attack us, we don't need your help. We can manage our own. Respect. I'm sorry about the pirate French accent, but this is, I love it. This is what I want from European leaders right now. Strength, uh, decisiveness, even a little bit of aggressiveness, and not a bit of fear. You don't, you, if, Russia is a shark. They smell your blood, they will eat you. You gotta kick them in the face and then they will love you for it. Yes, that's the Russian spirit. My friends, recently the Finnish, our Nordic brothers from Estonia, the Finnish up there, the people of Simo Hauha and the White Death and the Winter War, whoo! They elected the new president, Alexander Stoop. It's fairly fresh. And now he went to Ukraine. And not only, something big came out of it. According to the agreement, Finland will provide long-term military and financial assistance as well as a deep cooperation with Ukraine in the political, financial, humanitarian and reform spheres. Finland and Ukraine signed a long-term security and military assistance agreement. Same has done with Great Britain and France. Now three big, big militaries. Finland being the biggest reserve military and the biggest artillery force in the entire European Union, they have signed long-term military cooperation agreements. Putin's whole gamble is that the West will get tired. Now these agreements, one by one, these European countries stating that we will stand in Ukraine even if it takes a decade. This is a great L to Putin's face, that your gamble has failed. I see through your bluff and that in long term Putin will bleed dry, but Ukraine will get more and more and the defense will get stronger. <clears throat> I'm so proud to have Finland as a brother nation to Estonia, Finno-Ugric nation. First of all, they're 
experience from the Winter War was astounding and it was beautiful to watch how they fought back and now again seeing like how Macron acts towards the Russians he don't care he kind of pitch slapped them in the face Alexander Stubb from Finland the president is act acting the same way I have huge respect for this kind of action because the time of words is over now is the time of actions and now is the time of standing your ground resolutely and standing against tyranny, fighting for your values. It is not about go talking up to the enemy. Can you respect my borders, please? No. You come over my borders, you get poof, poof, you get pitch slaps in the face. That don't help, you get something more. Finland will also help Ukraine rebuild the energy sector assesses environmental damage, strengthen the protection of the border and critical infrastructure, as well as treat the Ukrainian military. Also, the president of Finland announced the provision of a new aid packet of 188 million. It's very generous from the Finnish, these amounts. Very generous. Kidos. Torilla Tavatan. That's what I always say. This next video, my friends, is very, very interesting. The Soviets made some of their artillery calibers slightly wider than the enemy shells, so captured ammunition could be used in Soviet guns, but not vice versa. It's fairly a genius doctrine, because if the enemy tries to use your caliber, it looks the same, it fits the barrel almost, but if you shoot it, it blows the barrel, or you cannot even shoot it, but it's almost as big. But the Soviets could use Western ammunition. It's, it's the difference of 2 millimeters. It's 150 millimeters, uh, 155 versus 152. It's 3 millimeters, right? Here is a Russian 82 millimeter mortar shell and it's being reduced to 81 millimeter to fit American uh, mortars, of which the United States provided 112. So what they do is they grind off the excess metal from it and it still fires and still shoots. It definitely reduces the range and accuracy a little bit, but it's fine. It's not that bad. I mean, we're at this stage of war where any kind of ammunition is good. So, if it works, do it. Oh, I always say that the French are getting Napoleon flashbacks. Well, Russians are also getting them. Napoleonic wars were extremely devastating for Russia, especially because they deployed their famous scorched earth policy, which means, yes, they won the war in the end, but they destroyed half of their own population by doing it. That's what they always do, because they don't really care about their people, because they mothers will give birth to new slaves for the Tsar anyway. Why care about the current ones? Well... Ever since Macron grew balls of steel, Russian propaganda is panicking. Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Zakharova has said that about 1,500 French soldiers will be sent to Ukraine as early as this month. They're trying to lessen the impact of the French communications by communicating back that they know when they're getting ready. In reality, they have nothing to get ready for. Everything the Russians have, every Military capability is right now focused against Ukraine. They have nothing extra to send. Nothing. That's what they have. That's their true might, what we see in Ukraine. Anything else, Ukraine gets extra from the West. Russians can say that now we're escalating also, but they have nowhere to escalate except for nuclear war because every other weapon system is already busy fighting the Ukrainians. According to her, the group will be put on full combat readiness in April to deploy the Ukrainian theater of military operations. Whether true or not, if the French are sending them in this month or not, I don't personally think they are at all. This is Russians trying to lessen the French uh, communications. But it gives us an idea that the French communications and Macron has an ability to so panic in Russian leadership because they know they don't have nothing else. If really big help from the West is coming, right now the, the West is trickling aid to Ukraine. If actual military personnel or huge amount of uh, aid is coming, the Russians are screwed. So this panic is a good sign that Macron is getting through, that Macron's tactic is working. And I've been saying it ever since, you cannot show your weakness, you've got to stand your ground. This is what Macron is doing. Zelensky also came out with a huge communication. It's according to him, and this is what he believes actually, Russia is preparing the mobilization of 300,000 soldiers for June the 1st, or 1st, or June in general, or around that area, summer area. Russians have about 600,000, 5 to 600,000 men in Ukraine right now in occupied territories. If 
this communication from the president of Ukraine is correct and Russia is aiming for a million men in Ukraine, close to a million men by the end of 2024. Now, if you, Russia is doing this, Ukraine definitely needs to be doing this because Ukraine also has about 400 to 500,000 men against the Russians. And if Russia gets uh, 300,000 extra, Ukraine needs to get 300,000 extra. That's just simple math of war. You, you cannot defend Somewhere in your defense there will be holes if your enemy has so much more men. Now, a crazy new drone from Ukraine and they're popping up like mushrooms after rain, like we say here in Estonia in the forest. You go after a rain, there's mushrooms everywhere. Well, in Ukraine there's drones everywhere. Everybody's making a new drone. Uh, we heard at the beginning months of war a lot about Bayraktar, Turkish Bayraktar. Why don't we hear about them now is because all of them have been shot down. They're very good drones, but they can be shot down with almost everything you have because they have a big radar cross-section. And you can, you can just shoot them down with whatever you have, every air defense system. So Ukraine has lost them, lost them all because it's war, that's how it works. If you don't have them in mass, you pretty much don't have them at all. So Ukraine needs to make them own. And now they have produced their own. Ever since the first Barakter was deployed in February 2022, and ever si up until nowadays, within two and a half years, they have been able to produce their own Barakter from zero. It is it's crazy. In civilian world, if you want to produce a new, new anything, this is like lightning speed for a drone like Barakter. The Falcon 300, drone manufactured in Ukraine, is reportedly ready for action. Range is 3,300 3, kilometers or 2,000 2, miles with a 300 kilogram payload, 660 pounds. Payload, it's not a kamikaze drone. Payload meaning it carries six, uh, 300 kilograms of missiles. An altitude ceiling of 9.1 kilo, kilometer, 30,000 feet. Let's look at this drone. It looks better than a Bayraktar. I'm not a fan of the look of the Bayraktar. I mean, its efficiency was really good. But the look of it, like the, the tail, not my thing. This one looks a bit better, I think. Look at it. Beautiful. Looks nice. Yeah. If Ukraine actually is able to produce them, as we can see, this is a real one ready. Uh, then 3,300 kilometers Honestly, most, I would say about 80% of Russian weapons manufacturing and military manufacturing capability is in that range. Yes, they have some factories in the Far East, like five, 6,000 kilometers away, but most, 80% biggest factories are in that range. And about two, 3,000 kilometers from the Ukrainian border, Russia knows that Ukraine cannot hit that far right now. So they even haven't bothered in defending these areas in any way, these factories or put air defense systems, even if they wanted to, they couldn't because everything is deployed to Ukraine, like I said many times. It's not like they, have to tr they, they can choose to just defend these areas in the depth. No, because they, they don't have air defense to take from anywhere. If they want to defend these factories 2,000 kilometers away, they have to take this air defense from the Ukrainian fronts and deploy it in the depths of Russia, which is really bad for them. Ukraine can fly their planes again then. So, in any way, this drone will wreak havoc right now already with the fear that the Russian factories are going to burn in the future in the 2,000 kilometer depth of Russian territory. It already is doing the purpose. And now finally, my friends, I'll bring you the Finnish naval fella, Joni Askola, his point. And it's a really good point because people in this war are looking at wrong parameters. And according to these parameters, they're saying that Ukraine is losing. Now, I'm stating with my clear face and clear analytical data here, and I'm not delusioned and I will explain everything, that Ukraine is winning this war right now. And if you think I'm crazy, then let's just let's go through the points. If you don't agree with me, put it in the comments and call me delusional. I've seen those comments all the time. I'm fine with them. With Russia's many disinformation campaigns and the general pessimism, it is easy to forget about how much of a Russian failure in Ukraine's success the war has been so far. Despite mobilizing its reserves, Russia has not been able to capture a single regional capital city in Ukraine. With Ukraine still holding all 22 regional capital cities and one special status city it had at the beginning of the invasion. Four cities, Donetsk, Luhansk, Simferopol and Sevastopol, these are like the biggest uh, Ukrainian cities that Russia actually controls. They all have been occupied since 
2014. So Russia hasn't captured any of the big ones. Kherson and Mariupol were the biggest ones, but they are also not like these regional powerhouse cities. They're just a little bit bigger cities. And they lost Kherson. Ukraine liberated it. And in Mariupol, Russia lost so many troops. You don't even want to know the number before they took it. Furthermore, Ukraine has managed to liberate almost half of the territories that Russia occupied during its 2022 invasion. Yeah, do you remember the maps of the first three months of war, February, March and April? Do you look at these maps? Russia has all these arms into Ukrainian territory. This was the Russian plan to take all of the country. Uh, if we look at the percentages, let's do that now. Showcasing the resilience of and effective defense strategies of the Ukrainian forces. Russia occupied 26.4% of Ukraine's territory in March 2022, one fourth of the entire country, one fourth, which was reduced to 18.5 in March 2024. So two years later, it is 18%. So you look, territory is not even how you should look at success in war at all. Success equals, in the most primitive terms, destroying the enemy's offensive capabilities. That is success in war, destroying their logistics. But, it, okay, let's look at the viewers. Some of the viewers just want explosions and occupying villages. Let's look at territory. Even according to this statistic, Russia is losing this war because they occupied 26%, now they occupy 18%. So in, even in, in that very primitive standard that is very limited in giving any kind of conclusions, we still can say, according to that primitive standard, that Russia is losing. Sheer territory occupied or liberated. Understanding the diminishing control of the occupied territories. Additionally, Russia has not even managed to occupy the areas it has allegedly annexed. In 2022 end or 2023 was it... Putin declared four occupied oblasts, Kherson, Luhansk, Donetsk, and uh, Zaporizhia, part of Russian Federation. Now, Russia doesn't control these oblasts. Not either of these oblasts they control fully. So they have not even, like, officially, according to Putin's eyes, where Russian Federation ends and stops or begins from these oblasts, they don't control their own territory, which they claim is their territory. So <laughs> they... they Occupy, they, they um, annex these territories into Russia before they could fully control them, and Ukraine has actually pushed them back on these territories. If we've been told in March 2022 that Ukraine would liberate such a significant amount of territory and stand resolutely two years later, we would have unquestionably viewed it as a monumental victory for Ukraine and a resounding failure for Russia. Now, yes, let's. We have all been expecting so much of Ukraine. Oh, they will do this powerful roundhouse kick and kick the Russians into Moscow and boom, defeat the country. My friends, let's go back to the first three months. I followed the war every day and every night, I could also say. I just refreshed every, I, every bit of information. I remember the fear, the panic, the insecurity, and I, I remember these sleepless nights. Ukraine was about to lose that war. And I was in that mindset, okay, I'm getting ready to fight because they're coming to Estonia next. If somebody said back then that Ukraine is pushing it back and they're, being, they're sinking the Russian Black Sea Fleet, they're attacking factories in Russia, deep inside Russia, they will have their own Bayraktar. I would have said, you're delusional, you're crazy. And this is what has happened. And yet still we measure the success in this war with micro villages liberated or occupied. No, it is about other capabilities. Ukrainian marine drones, they're sinking Russian ships monthly. Ukrainian drones, they're burning Russian factories and production capabilities daily in Russia. This is what we should be watching. This is what says who is winning, because the war is about logistics and offensive capabilities. Offensive capabilities are, for example, Black Sea Fleet missile carriers, which are in the bottom of the sea. And production is about the factories in Russia that produce weapons which are burning. And oil refineries are burning. So I'm just bringing back the real factors that measure success. And it's not one or two positions taken or liberated. It is not uh, one or two three square mile villages taken or liberated near Avdivka or Bahmut. It is about the bigger picture. And if we look at that in the grand scale of two and a half years, there's a very clear winner and loser there. 
So this is why I don't agree and understand people's pessimism about it. It's like, oh, this war, I read the news, this war is so dark. Yes, the news will give you this very limited, panicking outlook that Russia is advancing with a big, grand army. In reality, if you know the situation, you look into the data, statistics of this war, Russia is losing this war. Russia's initial strategic goals for the war were demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine. Both of which hinge on installing a pro-Russian public leadership, a feat that faltered at the onset of invasion and remains unattainable in the future. Also, Russia, Putin gambled that President Zelensky will flee, the government will collapse and they will take over the country. Even the first gamble failed. Zelensky stood in the capital when the missiles were flying and when there were assassination squads in Kiev hunting him. I've heard all of these stories of talking to the people of SBU, the special forces who actually, let's say it frankly, they knocked out cold these squads on the street. Many of them, tens of these Russian groups who infiltrated into Kiev to just assassinate President Zelensky. I've talking to the guys from SBU who actually, they neutralized that threat nightly. I cannot say daily because that all happened at night. They did it nightly. Hearing those stories and still seeing President Zelensky at the first months of war on the streets of Kiev saying, I'm here, come and get me. I need ammunition, not a riot. I have respect for that. The Russian Navy's series of humiliating setbacks in the Black Sea, coupled with the ineffectiveness of Russian air defenses against Ukrainian drone strikes on Russian defense and energy infrastructures, are additional factors that Russia would rather sweep under the rug. Now let's look at just some sheer data. Just, I, I, I need to remind people what is the perimeter of success, the constitution of success in this war. And it is not, and it will never be, as villages occupied or villages liberated by the sheer number of it. Ukraine begins campaign of blowing up Russian warships with their marine drones. And that happened at the end of 2023, about October, November, December. And then this is Ukrainian ships in Ukrainian ports and grain exports, for example. Before that, we are all Russian Black Sea Fleet. We need the Ukrainian grain export agreement with Turkey and Russia. And then Ukrainians were like, okay, we don't need it. Our marine drones will sink the entire Russian Black Sea Fleet. And immediately after that, we can see that Ukrainian exports are thriving. They're just selling their grain and exporting it, and Russia cannot do anything. Ukraine has been able to push Russia as a main Black Sea Fleet naval power away from the open waters of the Black Sea. Now this is success. Moreover, Russia's few allies and partners are hesitant to openly admit their support, illustrating the limited and discreet nature of Russia's alliances. This lack of covert support further isolates Russia and hampers its military campaigns in Ukraine. Additionally, time is not on Russia's side in this war against Ukraine, as the prolonged conflict has strained its resources and military position further complicating its campaign. Western production and aid is increasing all the time. And yes, people are again looking at a very limited picture that, oh, United States aid is stopping. Why are we focusing on it? It is not United States that is being attacked. It is Europe. Europe will protect Europe. Europe will protect Ukraine. It is our responsibility. United States can help or they cannot help. It doesn't really matter. That's not a right focus of energy. The right focus of energy is what the Finnish president Alexander Stubb and the French president Emmanuel Macron is doing. And that is focusing on our defense, not pointing blaming fingers on the United States. I, I can say thank you to the United States and now we will take it from here. That's the message. It is important for us to stay realistic about, uh, but also optimistic. We should not forget that Ukraine is paying the high price but winning this war and they are not doing so by being pessimistic. Yes. So, bring a smile to your face. Go watch some uh, cat or dog videos and be happy. And always look at this war with the right parameters, the right statistics. And if somebody names you that, oh, Russia is advancing with these meat tactics, then you know that this is just a very falsified and limited parameter to look and to base your success upon. And now my friends, 
butchering the Buy Me A Coffee members. If you become a monthly member, I'll be butchering your name to oblivion like the Russian tank turret that flies to the moon. That will be your name after you sign up. Fred Rovland, Anne Trotter, Kurt Magnus Deus Drakorum. Damn, what a name, Drakorum. Geti Knikt 22. Alexander Naidenov. Flirt Hilda and her dom. Flirt Hilda? What? Is that real? No way, that's somebody trolling me. Samurai Knikt 1600. Scott Parker, the brother of the famous Spider-Man, Peter Parker. I'm glad we have the brother of the uh, Spooderman uh, as a Buy Me A Coffee member. If you like my channel, you know what to do. Until my next video, which is tomorrow, my friends, press the subscribe button and the notification, the, the bell notification thingy, so you'll be notified. Slavo Krinje, and bye-bye.